Good morning, good morning, welcome to the Radio Burger King Live. If you will, join me in a moment of affirmative prayer as we have lit our 12 powers candles, if you will. Affirm with me that these powers are alive and viable in our life, knowing that we don't have to force or coerce these powers. We simply partner with that which is. We affirm that God is all there is, and we affirm that goodness lives here. And so we partner with the divine life, which is ours. We align ourselves with divine healing, and we allow the grace and the power and the presence of all that is good, all that is sacred, and all that is holy to manifest and unfold itself in us, with us, through us, and in this space. We affirm that everyone that walks through those doors will have and hear and receive that in which they need. And so we give up our light and we surrender it to be combined to the eternal flame that lives as unity in Birmingham, knowing that for every bit of energy that we devote to this place, that it will return back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We know that as we pour out or put out the flames today, that the flame will never die within our hearts. And it's in the name and the nature of all that is sacred, holy, and loving, we pray. Amen. And so it is. Ashe. I am free. I am unlimited. where I attend when I'm in California, I'm at Agape International Spiritual Center. So I've been a practitioner for a while. And what a wonderful thing it is to be a practitioner. That means we are practicing the presence. Yes. Not just talking about it, we are practicing it. I have a reading for you, and then we will meditate. 
And this first reading comes from a book by Reverend Michael, who is the, um, the person who started Agape International Spiritual Center. And this is 40 Day Mind, Fast, Soul, Feast. And this is taken from day one. It's entitled, The Soul's Organic Freedom. There's a wise Zen saying that you cannot stop birds from flying around your head, but you can prevent them from making nests in your hair. As you began to, to mature spiritually, you discovered that although you cannot stop the world's chatter about lack and limitations from whirling around you, you can prevent it from lodging in your consciousness. Yes. And so I invite you to take some deep cleansing breaths. And I'd also like you to just tense up, tense up your shoulders and every part of your body, just tense it up. <laughs> and then let go. Is Unity Family to have this opportunity to go within, to call from the divine, because it's indeed right where we are. There is no separation between God and I, and God and we. We have come here to this earth school to learn who and what. We are in our purpose for being here on this planet. And to know that there are no limitations. When we look out in nature, we see that there are no limitations. Everything knows exactly its purpose, its mission. And so do we. We don't live in lack worry, doubt, or fear, because we know that that does not serve our greatest and highest good. We're here to just be, be it, to practice it. It's about practice, brothers and sisters. Practice loving, being the love, knowing that we are washed over in and as love. To be peace, a peace that passes all human understanding. That's who we are. Be joy. For no apparent reason, just be the joy. If you have to put your music on to dance, just dance. Dancing is good. Singing is good. But it's all God. Whatever you're doing, like whether you're going to work, you're on your job, God is there. Allow the fullness of God to speak through it as you, moment by moment, brothers and sisters. It's so good to live in this world because it is the only life worth living. This life that is God's life is the only life worth living. There's nothing else, nothing else except this thing that Ernest Holmes says this thing itself. Life itself, we call it by many names. We call it the Most High God. We call it the Infinite Intelligence. We call it Atman Presence. We call it Allah. But we call from it because it is the only one to call from, and that is that one that is the I Am Presence. And it is us, the divine us, the best of us. We live it. We speak it in our conversations. We walk it. We have that. We we eat it because it is indeed delicious. Yes, it is. The creator of all life everywhere. When we look out in nature, we we see everything that this divine created doing exactly what it's supposed to do. The grass growing because you know there's no abundance but if you don't cut your grass it'll just grow and grow and grow. Fruits that grow from the trees abundantly there's no lack none brothers and sisters. So we just take a moment just be silent. We just 
recognize what is your purpose for being here? What is your purpose? Take a deep breath. tones as has been set throughout the service. Thank you. Peace and blessings. In that same spirit, if you will, now that the energy has been set, I want to say good morning to you that are gathered here today. It is a blessing to be gathered around the fire once again. I'm reminded about the old school griots who would sit around the fire or sit around the dinner table and tell stories about the days of old. And in those stories, you could almost hear your ancestors speaking and talking through those stories. And we are recreating that practice today, going all the way back to the early 1930s in the city of Birmingham, while a 12-member think tank decided to gather themselves before the release of the book, 12 Powers of Man. In fact, before, I believe, Charles and Cora Fillmore released The Atom Smashing Power of the Mind, 12 members in the city of Birmingham gathered together in a think tank, think tank sort of fashion and decided to brainstorm on what progressive spirituality would look like in the rural South, in the heart of the Bible Belt. It's powerful. And as we recreate that experience, I can feel the power of the 12 gathered around the table, brainstorming and thinking of what the presence of God showing up as them would look like and projecting almost 100 years into the future. That, my friends, is the power of visioning. And that is the power that you represent today. Each one of you represent the family members that could not make it today to be here with you. So you are representatives of that in which you are and the places and spaces in which you came. Say this with me, responsibility. So there's a divine responsibility to show up as love and to show up as God, to show up as divine intelligence. And the interesting thing about the way to do that is you simply open your eyes, put two feet on the ground, and then miracles happen. Because it's not by might nor by power, but it's by the spirit and the presence of the living one that these things get done. And so you get to sit back and enjoy it. You get to sit back and wonder and be in awe. Like when's the last time you've been inspired, been in awe, where you just stop and you're like, oh my God, this is a big deal. Oh my God, you see what we're doing right now? You guys are making history because if you look throughout American history, the most segregated time used to be was Sunday morning. And every time you gather together on Sunday mornings with people that don't look like you, that don't necessarily live where you live, come on somebody, that don't necessarily shop where you shop, although if you look for them now, you might see them, oh, look at them on the, on the, on the uh, kombucha aisle. You better go ahead and get your life together. I hear you. <laughs> but this is sacred activism. Every time you do this, and the presence of the living one is pleased because if you watch it, oh, the weather is supposed to be 60, it's supposed to be cloudy, and you gather together, all of a sudden the sun comes out. It's how powerful you are. And I'm sure the scientist in you is like, man, the sun was going to come out anyway. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Lucy. Everybody remembers Charlie Brown? Lucy would say, Charlie. You're like, what? You know what your problem is? What's that? Your problem is that you're you. What am I supposed to do about that? I don't know. I'm just here to point out the problem. <laughs> Lucy is always there. But Lucy has a voice, too, because if you go back and forth with Lucy, you'll get tired. 
So you learn that you don't shut your problems up, you simply grow past them. So while they are talking, you keep on walking. You keep on doing the work of spirit. You keep on living the truth that you know. And if you look to your left, Lucy will be right along with you because even though Lucy's complaining, she don't want to be left behind either. <laughs> and that is the miracle of all are welcome in the household of faith. The grumblers are welcome. The complainers are welcome. The people who are gossipers, they're welcome too. You know why? Because there is a place in a space. Of course, we ain't, we ain't, we ain't saying coming here with that nonsense. <laughs> but there is a place in a space for everyone. You know why? Because we all are gathered around the fire and we are all contributing our light and we are here for a purpose. That is the growth and the evolution of our soul's purpose. We want to eventually reach a point where we do like William Blake, where we can behold the world in a grain of sand. Y'all remember that? The innocence poem, behold the world in a grain of sand or heaven in a wild flower. You can hold eternity in your hand or timelessness in an hour. Mm -hmm. That is what happens when you gather together. Say this with me, forsake not forsake the not. gathering yeah. of yourselves together because something in you gets recharged. The introvert decides to step out and the extrovert decides to tone it down. You get recalibrated because you are forced to do something different and even your brain gets readjusted. You sit still for a moment. Look at you right now, sitting still. Think about your busy life. When's the last time you sat still for just a second? You didn't try to fix nobody. You didn't try to give advice. You didn't try to go to work. You didn't try to go home and cook. You just sat still and did something for you. Something that nourishes your soul, that speaks to your heart, that speaks to your spirit and teaches you how to move on. That, my friends, is powerful and that should be celebrated. Put your hands together for yourself if you would. And if you are just tuning in, welcome to Unity Birmingham Live. Our ministry is supported by partners like you to continue to make your contribution. Log on to unitybham.org and click on giving. Receive this special blessing from us. Point your hands at the camera, if you will. Say this with me. Divine love, Divine love. In, me. in me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that you are, all that you hear and receive. Know in this moment you are safe and you are loved. And so it is. This morning, I welcome you into the fourth part, third part of our series concerning life. And the series topic is life affirming. But today's title is Rejuvenation. Say this with me, Rejuvenation. rejuvenation. Man, rejuvenation is a tough thing because it can take a minute to get detangled from the stuff of the world before rejuvenation kicks in. And so spiritual practices, they teach you how to get good at getting loose. And they teach you how to get good at committing. And where we are typically is somewhere in the middle. But the more you do this practice, this practice of letting go and letting go and letting go, you get good at taking off one hat and putting on another and taking off the mask and putting on another. And then eventually, if you're watchful and prayerful, you get a chance to see your true face. Your true face is divine love, meaning I'm more than this job. I'm more than this account. I'm more, uh oh, <laughs> let me put a push, push pin right there. I'm bigger than this relationship. Uh oh, <laughs> because here's the thing. Say this with me, attachment and detachment. If you're too attached, then you, you, you lose your sense of self. If you're too detached, then you lose the relationship. And by relationship, I mean your relationship with your job, relationship with people, relationship with your friends, relationship with money, relationship to yourself. So somewhere in the middle is this harmonious equilibrium where you realize you're not afraid if this ends. Because this ending is another beginning from the womb to the tomb. They both are birthing experiences. So everywhere you go, there you are. You are always okay is what I'm saying. You are always protected. You are always safe. And digesting that 
you stop tripping when things change. <laughs> you get settled in your soul. At some point, it even seems like you don't care no more. <laughs> Say this with me. You grow up. You see things come. You see things go. This is what you want to do. Cool. That's what you want to do. Cool. You all right? Mm -hmm. You not mad? Nah. Why would I be mad? Because I am comfortable with me. And that, my friends, is rejuvenation. Because we get assigned things in life. Who gave you your name? Your mama. Did she ask your permission? No. <laughs> Change your name if you want to. <laughs> mm, that ain't the name I gave you. I ain't calling you that. I don't care what they call you in school. <laughs> but you get rejuvenated when you come back home to self. The prodigal son, all those stories, they're all about coming back home to self. And hopefully by the end of today, um, I can help you as you help me shine the light of awareness on our collective soul so that we realize there's no place to go. There's nothing else to achieve. It, there's nothing else that you need to be. You simply already are it. Thou art that in the Hindu tradition. And when you take that awareness into things, when you take that awareness into relationships, when you take that awareness into finances, into money, into the world, there's a confidence that comes. Lift up your head, all ye gates. Place your hand under your chin and just slightly tilt your head up. Lift up your heads, all ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And what happens? The king of glory comes in. Who is this king of glory? It's spirit, it's divine intelligence, strong and mighty. There is a confidence that comes into your soul and it revitalizes you. And guess what? You don't look like nobody else. You look like a bigger and better version of you. And that's what this resurrection season is about. It's about remembering who you are. Christ in you, Paul. The hope of glory. What is the Christ? It's the anointing. It's the awareness. It's the remembering of divine intelligence, of divine possibilities. It's the remembering of your unique yes. You remember what your yes sounds like? Because our yeses change over time. We get those, yeah, mm, yeah, and we get those, mm-hmm's. But you remember what a yes from the bottom of your soul sounds like when you really buy into a thing, something that you really want, right? Chocolate cake from Corner Cafe. <laughs> you want to go to Corner Cafe? Yes. <laughs> there is no tone in my yes, it's just air. Yes. <laughs> it's a growl, right? That kind of enthusiasm for life is what gives you your zest and your power, and it's how you season your life and season your relationships. I'm going to walk you through a story real quick. I know you love stories, but this is church. <laughs> so about this time, scripturally in the New Testament, we're about, this is the third week of Easter. So during this time, Jesus is performing all sorts of visitations. And when you look historically at the life of Jesus, it, you really do understand how and why he was able to build community. Many of the folks that were in his community were actually his family members. And we don't talk a lot about that. You see it in the Catholic Church. You see it in Episcopal writings. You see it in Unitarian writings. But we don't talk heavily about the family life and family dynamics of Jesus. First of all, when he was born, after his birth, it said in the book of Luke that there was an old woman named Anna who greeted him and she spoke a prophecy over his life. That woman, Anna, historically is his grandmother. She was called prophetess Anne, and it's very similar to Hannah, etymologically speaking, in the Old Testament, which is why the New Testament revealed is sort of the Old Testament concealed. You look in one, you can see the other. They're kind of similar. And it's a literary technique by our ancient ancestors who were so smart that they told you something, and then they told you how they were going to tell you, then they told you a different way so you can understand, and then they gave you a story and a song about it to help you remember. Because, say this with me, do this in remembrance of me. 
you do something over and over again, you start putting the parts of yourself back together. And if I can put a push pin here, some of us, there are practices that we used to engage in that used to give us so much joy. Y'all remember that? Think about on this day, the things in your life that you've given up for other people. The things in your life that you've said yes to that you really didn't want to do that now you do over and over again. If you got them things, when you leave here today, stop doing them because you really don't want to do them anyway. If you know what I'm talking about, say yes. yes. If you don't like to go to that restaurant, don't go there no more. You don't like to eat that food, don't eat that no more. You don't like to talk all day on the phone, don't talk all day on the phone. And if you really don't want to talk to them, hit ignore. <laughs> say this with me, don't force yourself. This is how you get rejuvenated. You start identifying wholly and completely with your yes. And guess what? No is not a curse word. <laughs> no does not mean I hate you. No does not mean I don't like you. No just means not for me. I am complete. A no to me might mean a yes to her. Try this avenue. No, but I want it to come from this way. And that is our issue. We get attached to the outcome. And here's the thing. The outcome belongs to God, divine intelligence. Ours is simply to show up as divine love. And however it comes, however it happens, that part belongs to God. So you let go. Let go. And so Anna is Jesus' mother, back to the story. I mean, grandmother. She's the mother of Mary. And Mary also, in some instances, is a, a called a prophetess, which explains the human side of his divine capabilities. But many of the folks that followed him were his cousins. And we talk about James, the brother of the Lord, who became bishop in Jerusalem, and all of these wonderful things. But about this time, three weeks after Easter, this is after the experience in the room with Thomas on last week. And we talked about that. Thomas is called Didymus. And in some traditions, Didymus, of course, means twin. He's called the twin because he's the twin brother of the Lord. This is why Thomas could say to Jesus, everybody else is quiet. I'm not sure because I remember when you were born, you had this birthmark on your leg. You had this weird ear shape. I know things about you that nobody else knows. In fact, let me ask you a personal question. Let me stick my finger in your side because can't nobody poke you like family, right? And so <laughs> he sticks his finger in there and goes, oh, my God. And Jesus tells Thomas, oh, my goodness, you believe because you've seen. Can you imagine those who have not had this experience and they still have to believe? And this empowers Thomas. And then his story, history says that he goes to India and starts the, the biggest movement in Christendom. And they call it the Martoma Church, St. Thomas Christians. But about this week, which is week three after Easter in the story, he's appearing and he's meeting and people are having visitations. Because what happens is at some point in your spiritual practice, according to the story, Things that used to be outside of you spiritually, you start really identifying with them and having deep communion with them. And the experiences outside or out here in the world match the experiences on the inside. We say in unity, thoughts are things. Say this with me, thoughts are things. Yes. Meaning that there's a direct connection out there and out here. And so at this point in the story, Jesus is traveling down Emmaus Road. Now Emmaus in scripture means hot or warm springs and it's not too far from Jerusalem now we're talking this month about life affirming as the theme and today's topic is rejuvenation and he's walking towards a road called warm springs when's the last time some of you went on vacation I just put another push pin there when's the last time you were really saturated in pleasure and comfort because believe it or not, a lot of our grumpiness is because we've removed pleasure and comfort out of our lives. The resurrection of your soul comes through the rejuvenation of your physical body. When you deny yourself pleasure, deny yourself the good that you need to experience in your body, your soul gets grumpy, your soul gets tired, your soul gets twisted up. And so, back to the story. He's walking down Emmaus Road, not too far from Jerusalem. And he comes across two individuals. Now, the story says that the one individual that he meets 
That person's name is Cleopas. The other person that he meets has no name. It's a literary trick. The reason why this person has no name is because the writer wanted you to insert your name in the story. So you are walking with Cleopas down the road of Emmaus and you meet the Christ on the road. I want to tell you, the Christ that you meet out there ain't no different than the Christ in here. The only reason why I'm holding this microphone is because I went to seminary. You go to seminary, you can hold this microphone too. Say this with me, we are all one. And rejuvenation comes from that. You level the playing field. You stop projecting your good out there and you see that the same good that's out there is right over here. If God can bless them, God can bless me. If they can be successful in their business, so can I. If they can be good over here, then it can also work over here. Say this with me, what's over there? It's also over here. And sometimes it's just a uh, green light shining on brown grass. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> and so they're walking down the road of Emmaus and the one disciple is left unnamed. The other disciple's name is Cleopas. Now Cleopas, whether you call him Cleopas or Clopas or Alphaeus historically is considered to be the same person. <clears throat> this individual is also a part of Jesus's family. So Jesus, as an interesting individual, he's not just appearing to people, but he's having a family reunion. He's telling everybody, hey, I know y'all were crying. I know y'all were upset. But guess what? They might have killed the body, but not the soul. <laughs> For those of you that have had attacks concerning your reputation, know this, that they can kill the body. They can kill your reputation or try to. There's a part of you that cannot die. In the Bible Gita, it says that your soul is immortal. Can, water cannot wet it. Fire cannot burn it. It's eternal was never born, was never died, which means that your truest self is always alive. It's always rejuvenated. Ours to do is to connect and partner with that part of ourselves that already is. And this is what we do on Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings, we come together to remind ourselves. Some of you come together on Sunday morning in spaces and places, and if you're honest with yourself, you can say, I don't learn nothing new in church. I don't get anything new, but I come for the social connections. What you're coming together to do is to remind yourself that you are already enough, that you are already complete as you are. So if you hear anything that I say, all the scholarly stuff, all the poetry, all the fancy stuff, all the jokes, hear this this morning. You are already enough as you are. You don't have to force or coerce the Christ consciousness to awaken within you. Yours to do is to recognize that it's already oak. So back to the story. They're walking down the road to Emmaus. They're having a conversation. And then at some point, they realize there's something about this individual. They remember it. They see it outside of themselves. They remember it. And so they have a conversation. And then Cleopas says, come and dine at my house. I feel like I need to invite you over for dinner because you seem like family. Well, historically, Cleopas is family. He's the brother of Joseph, so he's Jesus's uncle. Joseph, Jesus's stepfather. If we call him stepfather, use human language. Joseph, Mary, Jesus. Stepfather. So Cleopas is his uncle, so he goes to the house. The house looks familiar, everything looks familiar, and then all of a sudden, he picks up the bread and breaks it, and their eyes open and they remember who he is. Then he disappears out of their sight. This, my friends, is the key to rejuvenation. Y'all ready for it? When you deeply, deeply commune with the divine, and you do that by recognizing that there is not a spot where God is not, when you create sacred spaces in your home, when you can see the sacred in the world, when you can see the sacred in a conversation, when you can recognize that you are an embodiment and an ambassador for good, that, my friends, is deep community. You can find deep communion in a wonderful conversation with a friend by beholding the God in them. You can have deep communion by walking outside in the cool of the day. You can have deep communion by watching a wonderful television show, by laughing, by kidding around, by joking, by eating good food. Come on, somebody. All of those things, all of those principles are the good, which is why we say God, the good, omnipotent, meaning wherever you go, there you are. And wherever you are, God is, so all is well. So whatever you decide to do, when you put your heart and your soul in it and your intentions in it and your yes lines up 
Rejuvenation automatically happens. There is no button you have to push. You don't have to force. You don't have to fight. You just say yes to what already is. And you say yes on this morning. Yes. So in the story, they disappear from where Jesus disappears from their sight. Because historically, we say that he disappeared from their sight because he manifested in their heart. And until these teachings become alive in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, they're just information. They're just bedtime stories. They're just mythology. And we come together and do the same thing over and over and over again. So ours to do is to commit to living these truths. These truths are self-evident. These truths are mystical, but they are simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know why? Because you meet no one but you. All we have is our perceptions and our judgments about people, but never who the actual person really is. So when you make me upset, it's my perception and my judgment about what you're doing that's making me upset. It's never the real you. So everywhere I go, there I am. So until these teachings become alive in my heart, they're just information. So I encourage you on this week while everybody's quiet. I'm going to put you to sleep. <laughs> practice the presence. And we say practice the presence because it is a practice. It's more of a journey than a destination. There is no arriving in God. There is no point at which you can say, I finally got it. It's a journey of twists and turns and ups and downs. You know what we call those? The vicissitudes of life. Can I put another pushpin in the message? Sometimes life just happens. Shift hits the fan. <laughs> it does not mean that you are a bad person. It doesn't even matter if someone did something wrong. Because you know what crucifixion is? Crucifixion is just a crossing out of error. Crucifixion occurred on Golgotha Hill, yes? Golgotha Hill, historically, is supposed to be, according to mythology, the place where the skull of Adam is buried. Adam means earth being. Skull is right here. Golgotha means place of the skull, which means crucifixion happens in the mind. Once you get it together here, this is the temple of God. Between your two temples, place your hand on your left or right temple. This is the temple of God better known as headquarters. <laughs> so when you get it right up here and you say, you know what? I'm going to start living these things. These 12 principles are going to be more than just colors on my wall. These seven chakras are going to be more than just something that I talk about. This Christ consciousness is going to be more than a fancy word, no different than abracadabra. This is going to be something that we embody where we walk out into the world and our experience of the world changes. <laughs> this is also what Jesus means when he says, turn the other cheek. He means to find a different perspective, find a different way of looking at it. Y'all remember your old self? The self that you used to be yesterday? <laughs> the self that you were last week? The self that was reactive to life as opposed to responding to life? Because when we respond to life, things move forward. Things get better over time. It may not change overnight, it gets better over time. You know why? Because we realize that the world in here leads the world out there. So crucifixion, the crossing out in consciousness of error happens up here in the mind where we point to the mind at or as. And when you get it in consciousness, then you can embody it and live it out in life because you can only have, folks, that in which you are conscious of. If you are not conscious of wealth and prosperity, then giving you a million dollars, you'll squander it. If you are not conscious of how to use a grant, you'll find yourself in jail. <laughs> that grant was not meant for a new car, clothes, baby. That grant was meant to build that homeless shelter and stuff. <laughs> if you are not conscious of the people in your life, you will misuse and mistreat them. If you are not conscious of good things that come your way, you won't realize them until they're gone. Who's ever lost anything? 
It's ever lost anything good. Life is filled with those stories. But you know what? As soon as you recognize, recognize up here in headquarters what you got, who you are, what you're working with, and the nature of this life, then all of those doors that were closed open. Aldo Suxley had a book called Expanding or Opening the Doors of Your Perception. Of course, he was talking about LSD. We won't go there. <laughs> but the spiritual teachings, you can open the doors of your perception and see a brand new, already existing world. Or in the words of T.S. Eliot, to experience this thing as if it were the first time. To experience that kiss as if it were the first kiss. To experience that hug as if it were the first hug. This is what rejuvenation does, and this is what the power of the resurrected Christ as it comes alive in your very being does to your experience in the world. Because you realize there is nothing that separates you from the goodness of God. You know why? Because you are the goodness of God already seeking to express itself. So you don't have to go look for a good experience. I am a good time. You don't have to go look for fun. You are already the life of the party. So there is nothing that you need that exists outside of you. Johnny Coleman used to say, the only thing you're missing is an idea. Because behind everything in this world, in this universe, is an idea. And when you close the doors and tune in, in the words of Reverend Lang, to the theater of your mind and lift up yourself in consciousness, you draw all corresponding persons, places, and things to you. So you get it in consciousness first. Because this is the power of the resurrected Christ. And this is what happens when you stop looking at Emmaus as a story that happened in the first century and you see it as an experience that happens every day. Every day we are walking in the world and having conversations and we go back and forth between seeing good in here and seeing good out there. But you know what life does? Life does not punish us. The Christ, or Jesus the Christ, did not punish the disciples for their lack of awareness. He didn't yell at his uncle for not realizing that he was still his nephew. Nah. Played the game, went to the house, broke bread. And it was something about the way he baked that pie. It was something about the way he broke that bread. It was something about the way he helped prepare that food. Communion is what awakens us to who we really are. So put your hands together for yourself for coming here today. Because we do this every Sunday, y'all. Every Sunday we come together. And I want you to pause and think about it. I'm about to butcher my message real quick. <laughs> but think about it. We do the same thing every Sunday. But we do it to remind ourselves of who we really are. And that reminding of ourselves, as simple as it is, is the core of spiritual practice. The core of it isn't about learning anything new. It's not about a new theological trick with the scripture. I can interpret scripture because I was an English major in college. But even without that interpretation, living the truth you know, practicing the principles of love, of joy, of peace, of understanding. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. In other words, peacemakers will have a lot of friends. You want more friends? Become a peacemaker. You want more love? Embody love. You want more money? Demonstrate prosperity by affirming I am prosperity. You become the thing that you want in your life, and then it manifests. That is the goal of resurrection, and that is the, the crux of the story. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And I'll close with this. There's an old school theologian teacher, and he said this, do not ask what the world needs. Come alive, because what the world needs needs is more people who have come alive and when you come alive and accept that lived reality and decide to live it out folks everything and everyone in your world changes for the good
This is the power of the resurrection. This is the power of the lived Christ and of the Christ consciousness. And I invite you to take this message and go forward in your life and heal and restore everyone that's in your environment. And you will see a change. Thank you for listening. Peace and blessings. Before you go, <laughs> Uh, if you do give online, remember to log on to unitybeham.org and click on giving. Um, LaDonna's going to lead us in a special selection as our ushers make their way forward for those that do give in person. Turn this part of the service over to LaDonna. <laughs> short announcements. LaDonna is bringing together individuals who would like to sing as a group. So if you're interested in singing as a group with LaDonna, please see her after service. And Reverend Jesse is launching a spiritual writers club to increase our digital outreach. So he's looking for writers, authors, poets, artists. If you're interested in that, you can send your submissions to Rev Jesse Beham at gmail.com, or you can see Reverend, or and you can see Reverend Jesse after the service. Our next spiritual enrichment class is this coming Sunday, April 30th, and it's going to be based on Joseph Murphy's The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. 
If you signed up for the class and you don't have your book, please see Reverend Jesse and or Lily to get your book. And also, uh, a week from this Thursday, May the 4th, we're going to be starting bingo downstairs. So Bruce will be Ooh. down there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody get excited about bingo Thursday. Do you have a time, Bruce? 7 o'clock. At 7 o'clock on Thursday, May 4th, will be our first bingo fun evening. And with that, let us all stand and sing our closing hymn. Wherever I am, God is and all is well.